to score more than 300 300 plus marks in law optional because optional is the fundamental thing to get you into IAS and IPS to get good ranks. Good morning guys. So today I will be taking your international law classes. Uh, now let me introduce uh, myself briefly. Uh, my name is Gagan Singh Parmar. I am a graduate of uh, National University Bhopal from 2016 batch. Currently, I am working as an advocate in Supreme Court of India. I have uh, prepared for over 7 to 8 years for UPSC and I wrote 4 mains and I scored one of the highest marks in uh, law option. And uh, here I will be guiding you to score more than 300, 300 plus marks in law option because optional is the fundamental thing to get you into IAS and IPS to get good ranks. Without optional, you won't score good. And in law, we have seen that people are not crossing 250. So I will be basically rectifying that issue that why people are not crossing 250 marks and why they are they are giving that edge to people from Paul Science and people from Anthro where they are easily getting 300 marks because of good coachings and good test series. That's what we are lacking in law. So I will try to fulfill that gap. Now, with international law, we will move with uh, interdisciplinary knowledge. We will look forward that why a particular law is made, how things evolved and why uh, why certain type of uh, conventions are done. So we will look in World War One, World War Two, and uh, before that uh, the European wars and how this whole system has evolved with time. Because unless and until you have a conceptual understanding, you won't be able to uh, write good answers and get good marks. So let us start. Now there is a topic that almost uh, comes every year. The questions that are framed this topic are uh, like is international law a vanishing, vanishing point of uh, jurisprudence? Is international law really a law? Is international law a soft law? So these are the questions that comes from uh, this uh, topic called introduction of international law. Now, due to the nature of international law, now what is international law? Now, the world community as such lack any parliament like we have. Like in India, we have a parliament that makes laws. Those laws are superior, those laws are supreme and everyone has to follow. And for example, IPC or uh, right now, this uh, the current, current government has amended our criminal laws. Bharti Nyay Sahita, Bharti Dhanda Sahita. And, uh, the parliament uh, has the requisite majority to do it. They're uh, our public representative. We have a system of election where we elect them and then they make laws for us. Now, what about the international laws? What happens is that there is no international legislative body that can make international law. So how are those particular rules framed, which we call international law? For example, law related to sea, law related to airspace, law related to diplomacy, how they were framed, law related to war, war crimes. Right now we are seeing that people are questioning Israel's war in Palestine and South Africa has went to international criminal court against uh, Israel. So how these things have evolved and why there are questions about the validity of international law. Is it a weak law? Is it a strong law? So, if we see the development of international law, initially, it has evolved due to the relationship between different nations. Whenever there are two nations, three nations, four nations. For example, if we see the Mahabharat of uh, Ramanan Sagar, the old Mahabharat, they have an understanding that nobody, that nobody will fight in the night. So after uh, the sunset, there used to be no war. Then uh, they have, they, then we also see that whenever someone used to die in that particular battle of Mahabharata, they were given proper, uh, proper ceremony on their death. And everyone used to be there at a single place. So, they who framed those laws? They were not framed by by a legislative body, by by two countries. For imagine maybe 
Kuru Pradesh, maybe some other uh, Mahajanpas that were existing at that time, they had a convention that uh, we shouldn't fight it, right? And then everybody adhered to it. And from mm, from Mahabharata, we also have this quote: "Dharma rakshita rakshita." So if you protect the dharma, dharma will protect you. What is dharma? Dharma is not a religion in the modern sense, but dharma means. justice equity and fairness so if you are fair if you are just then society will protect you so if one country is following law then other countries will also follow the same for example in diplomatic immunity we see that all the ambassadors they are diplo- they have this diplomatic immunity we cannot have a file a case against them now if if one country breach it then the other country will breach it too for example in the case of devani khobra gade that happened uh, way back at the time uh, i think 5 or 6 years back when uh, devani khobra gade is one of our uh, ifs officers she was posted in usa and uh, she has uh, some trouble with her domestic maid her maid filed a case against her in the local courts and uh, they arrested her despite having diplomatic immunity so at the same time india also waived the diplomatic immunity of us embassy we remove the barricades from in front of the us embassy we reduce the security level and this in uh, this way we protested and at then the american government uh, accused to our uh, demands and released her so that's how international laws are framed followed by one country over the other we have major sources of international like custom treaties conventions and now even judgments of some courts like icj so today we will be dealing with a very particular uh, topic called validity of international law is it's a true law it comes under the broader uh, broader topic of nature of international what is the nature of international law is it a law is it it's not a law it's a weak law so we will we will focus on this question that is international law a weak law So there are uh, two school of thought on the validity of international law. One school, which is led by Austin and Holland, these are the two authors. So Austin says that this international law is basically rules of positive morality and not a law. Now why does uh, Austin says this? So he says that uh, for any law to be considered a law, there need to be three com three things. then need to be a command then need to be a sovereign and then need to be a sanction because he defined law as a command of sovereign so there has to be command there has to be sovereign there has to be sanction now in international law there is no sovereign legislation there are no adequate sanctions and there is no enforcement agency like we have a police we have judicial system So there is no international police. There is no international enforcement agency who can enforce international law. So, for example, if today Russia and Ukraine are fighting, and if uh, Russia has violated the international law, then how to punish Russia? How to sanction it? <laughs> then Holland. Holland also calls it a vanishing point of jurisprudence. Vanishing point of jurisprudence effectively means that. Uh, the recognition of international law is slowly coming down and it is not considered a law so there is no point in debating or in studying international law and debating on international law and why holland says this he says that uh, international court of justice lacks compulsory universal jurisdiction the nature of international law is uh, is vague and un- uncertain customary rules are there in which there is no certainty one country says that one thing and one country says other thing so this is the first school which completely deny international law which says that international law is weak law it's a soft law and it's a vanishing point of jurisprudence now on the other hand jurists like openheim and stark take a other standpoint this is that international law is law it's a valid law though it might be weak but still it's a law for example today we might have a law against black money but then you cannot deny that there is no law to curtail black money 
we might be having a law that uh, completely sanction theft but then people are uh, stealing all the time robberies are done on the banks so what oppenheim says that that nation's consent is the basis of international law like in our domestic law a individual consent in a similar way in nation consent to international law then he says that it is constantly recognized by the states as a law in practice both legally and morally not just morally not just a positive morality but it is legally so for example whenever a country breaks a law they cite certain type of exception for example when russia invaded euro ukraine what this says is that we are doing it as a self defense we are doing it for our own people the russian minority there to protect them we are not violating international law we are protecting it now now openheim says that even in violation they are recognizing the law so though they might be violating it but they are recognizing it so it can't be termed just a morality what is morality morality is ki you should be have well with people this is morality because there is no law to tell you that uh, if you are if you are being rude to people can we can we find you can we take you to court no so he says that you cannot reduce the whole gamut of international to mere positive morality at the end it's a law it might be a weak law but it's a law and international and people try to justify their conduct the countries try to justify their conduct by international for example india pakistan war so though war as an instrument is prohibited what india said that we are attacking the eastern pakistan to protect our own people because uh, bangladeshis were constantly coming to india india has a refugee crisis now how to handle it so we are protecting the people from the army which has lost the popular mandate a government that is killing its own people and that's how india defended that particular act similarly when it come to nuclear power when we conducted 98 nuclear test it was against the treaty prohibiting uh, prohibiting the test but what we say is we says that uh, if uh, the countries who have atomic bombs can do it why 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 can't we so we took a exception to it we never says that we are not bound by it or we are not we are not saying that uh, there shouldn't be any law that should uh, that, that should manage the nuclear powers perfect now comes stark now stark says that uh, he he brings into uh, what we call uh, anthropologists cul juris like uh, main so he says that in primitive societies law used to be there without legislative authority like in tribals so though there is no legislative authority still people have certain basic rules certain way to conduct their business for example trust trust is a basic thing in every society if you are doing something then you have trust then only a society can function then he says then he counter the criticism of austin that international legislative presence is there in the form of law making treaty and multilateral treaty because uh, if you see the process of treaty making essentially there are 100 50 countries their representatives are there they discuss every section of the treaty for example we have montreal protocol now we are, we are having kyoto protocol we are having uh, this earth summit and we have whole environmental jurisprudence so he says that uh, countries send their representative and they agree on certain things and then they frame a treaty so in a way in a way there is some legislative body that is framing it now the question of international law is it should be treated as legal and not moral why should be treated as legal is because who is conducting international law it is the nations that are conducting international law and when nations are conducting they doing it by their own will power then he says that un charter united nations charter is based on the legality of international law 
if we can say that uh, there is no international law it's just a positive morality then we have the whole united nation and un charter functioning on the basis of it now now we move to certain certain state practices and how they have treated international law because uh, you have to write it when the question comes sometimes they ask that uh, uh, describe the nature of international law with citing examples of state practices so usa and uk they have uh, treated it as a part of their own law both of them both of them have done this so you can always write it that they have also recognized international law in some way or the other so at the end when we have written all this we have written both the both uh, the schools we have given the school of austin and holland which criticizes international law and says it is not valid it's not legal and then we have to counter it with oppenheim and stark and then we have to conclude so what we can conclude is that the modern the modern conception of state is itself a creation of international law and it is by the canons of international law that rights and duties of a state is defined because today wherever we do like we go to the sea we have certain rights and duties that uh, the other state has to give to the other states the respect there are laws that govern everything you you will go for a for a foreign trip to any european countries then at the end uh, they are governed by international law how to treat you so stark says that it might be a weak law but still a law so you cannot deny that it is a law so whenever we will conclude it we will always conclude it with stark's observation now this is uh, this is one topic of uh, international law that we have seen and over the time over the time it has uh, this question has uh, always come so whenever whenever you are you are re- reading it keep in mind that you have to write on it and only after uh, only after uh, writing it and practicing it you will be able to score good marks now about international law one more thing it's not ipc or contract where there will be sections and you will be memorizing those those sections and you will be writing it so what you have to do is you have to go to the go through the pyqs identify the themes the themes that are very constant for example the theme i just taught you about uh, about the nature of international law it's a very constant theme now memorize these jurist austin holland stark oppenheim memorize some conventions some examples and try to write in the language of these jurist and uh, these conventions what will happen is that they will they will give you that edge when we will write it because everybody is know what is the nature of international law it's a weak law it's a strong law blah 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 but how will you fetch marks if i give you this is in a 15 marks this topic is a 15 mark question then i need it like i need a good introduction i need the name of this jurist and i need point wise what they have said and how openheim and stark has countered it and then i need a very nice conclusion maybe with some example a very recent example like you can you can say how people are criticizing these genocides and how post uh, post un colonialism has stopped because it has been considered a very bad practice government over the time has been forced to give independence to the african countries and asian countries from 1950 to 70 we see decolonization of africa how it has happened it has happened because of the un charter it was the effect of the un charter that decolonization happened because the world as such criticized it that it is wrong to enslave a whole nation just because they are technolo- technologically inferior to it so so we have to be we have to relate it to current affairs we have to be uh, thorough with our concept we have to understand that 
exactly what was being criticized and exactly what is the issue in this particular topic else you will just read 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 and you will reach nowhere so first thing have a good conceptual clarity second thing see the boqs then understand what has been asked from this particular topic then make uh, either write their own answers like uh, like good answers to the pyq with good introduction conclusion and body and the body should be very specific because the nature of law is very technical very technical it is not uh, your gs paper where you can write whatever you want so you have to be that technical that this these are the issues and these are the answers language should be legal and not general like you should not write these things in your own words try to see what exactly was austin has said from any good book you will see it or i will be providing you handwritten notes for it i will also be providing you model answers for the past year questions and if you can and then start memorizing it and if you do this i am very sure that uh, you will be scoring 300 plus in your optional and uh, and scoring 300 plus will automatically give you that edge over your competitors you will be at least be having a lead of 100 marks because people generally score general score in optional is 220 230 that's how people score in every option not just in law because in law to there are no good coachings or no good uh, test series are available who can help you but even if you look at paul science and through people are majority of means people are scoring 220 230 because to reach from 220 to 300 it need a good amount of effort which can only come by answer writing by conceptual clarity and by writing answers in a way that satisfy the needs of the question so this topic nature of international law can be asked in various forms what are the forms like what is the validity of international law is it a true law or it's uh, not a true law then sometimes they just quote uh, austin and they says that uh, international law is nothing but rules of positive or reality and they will uh, uh, add it tailored to the question like analyze it then another form they can ask the topic is they, they can quote uh, holland and say it's a vanishing point of jurisprudence and they will add a tailored to it accordingly they can ask in 10 marks 15 marks or 20 marks other <coughs> sometimes they also quote openheim and then they ask you the same thing so you have to write same thing in all those questions so you doesn't need to write different answers for every every one of them then sometimes they uh, quote stark and says that uh, international law is a weak law but it is, uh, it is still a law then also you have to write the same thing that i have just taught you so they might ask the same question in different ways but at the end you have to write the same content so keeping keep this in mind whenever you are uh, practicing your international law always try to find out the themes find out the pyqs and try to understand ki what is the demand of the question because if you are not satisfying the demand of the question the examiner won't give you good marks he has no idea how good you are in your academics in your particular college or how much knowledge you have of this topic for example student a might know every case related to nature of international law he might be knowing all the uh, contention the conventions and how it has developed student b might be just knowing what austin said and what openheim said and what holland said and what stark said now student b will get more marks he will at least beat student a by 2 to 3 marks so prepare with a perspective of writing good answers not with the perspective of just having a lot of knowledge because unless and until uh, your knowledge can come in this piece of paper like this straight a size paper maybe one side or two side unless and until you can you can bring that down jot that down to this uh, a4 size paper that knowledge of is of no use so keep those things in mind and we will uh, meet again okay thank you guys